Good afternoon. I think we might get uh, get started and roll into the final session for today. Uh, if you guys could kindly take your seats and uh, and prepare to settle in for a fantastic final panel. So, uh, good afternoon. My name is Ian Sheldon. I'm the director of the intergovernance team from the Australian Government Department of Infrastructure and, and other things, and I'll be your host for the rest of this afternoon. Um, I would like to start by acknowledging the Yagara and Turbul people who are the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet here today. I would also like to pay respects to the elders, both past, present, of the Yagara Nation and the Turbul Nation and extend that respect to other First Nations Australians who are present here today or joining us online. So this afternoon we'll be, taking, we'll be talking further about cooperation and bridging any potential gaps between the technical community and policymakers. Uh, so we heard just now about the challenges of, of some of the technical management of the internet uh, developing standards and, and some of the uh, um, challenges the private sector might face in navigating various jurisdictions. Um, I'd like to change tack a little and broaden the conversation out to look at the challenges of developing legislation and, and regulation on, on digital issues. Um, increasingly, we're seeing uh, digital become a part of mainstream policy. Uh, traditionally, you could put digital in a, in a bucket and, and manage the issues separately, but it's increasingly part of all government policy making decision. Uh, this obviously poses uh, a lot of challenges for the traditional approach to, to, to policy making. So this afternoon, we'll unpack some of those challenges and explore how governments can continue to balance regulation of issues on the internet while safeguarding the, the internet itself. Um, so the way I wanted to structure the session was we'll give each speaker, each speaker um, a little bit of time to provide some initial thoughts. We'll move through a bit of a structured discussion and then open the room up. Um, I'd really like this to be an interactive session with discussion um, both amongst all of our esteemed panelists and, and the audiences as well as everybody online. Um, so I'd like to introduce you to our fast, fantastic panel this, this afternoon. Uh, we have uh, Edmund Chung, who is currently the CEO of Dot Asia and is also the vice chair of the Internet Society Hong Kong chapter. Jordan Carter, who uh, hopefully you have heard uh, plenty from throughout the course of the, the week. Um, Jordan is currently Internet Governance and Policy Director at the .au Domain Administration and was previously the CEO of Internet NZ for almost a decade. Uh, we have Susan Chalmers, who is the policy specialist with the Office of International Affairs at the US Department of Commerce's National Telecommunications and Information Administration. Uh, Susan leads the NTAA's internet governance team. And finally, we also have uh, Rajnes Singh, who is the regional vice president for the Asia Pacific at the Internet Society, a, a not-for-profit organization dedicated to ensuring the open development, evaluation, and use of the internet worldwide. So I might kick off by giving the floor to Susan. Thank, Thank you. you, Ian. And good afternoon, everybody. It's an honor to join this panel. And thank you to the IGF Secretariat for the invitation. Thank you also to the APRIGF Multi-Stakeholder Steering Group for its hard work in organizing the APRIGF and to AUDA, the host of APRIGF 2023. I was thinking about beginning um, with uh, some words around uh, the multi-stakeholder system of internet governance. <clears throat> Uh, and then I'd like to move into some more practical examples of how my agency and the United States Department of Commerce uh, offers assistance to parliamentarians or Congress, um, uh, and then uh, also provide an actual example of a multi-stakeholder initiative that NTIA has worked on uh, to solve an internet policy issue. So the global internet is a massive network made up of roughly uh, 75,000 different component networks 
these component networks vary in their size, their shape, their structure, and in their ownership, they are run by private companies, public sectors, communities, and individuals. And the reason why the global internet has such significant value is because these different networks are able to connect with each other. They are stitched together by technical protocols developed by people at the Internet Engineering Task Force, or IETF. I sometimes visualize the internet as a funny looking but infinitely fascinating quilt. And the patches of this quilt are wildly different uh, from each other in terms of size, shape, color, and texture, but they are held together by a common thread. And that thread is unique and it represents the internet's names, the domain names, the internet's numbers or internet addresses and its technical protocols. And it is that thread that keeps this quilt tied together as an unfragmented whole. And that thread is the multi-stakeholder system of internet governance. Governments play an important role in the multi-stakeholder system. Uh, we input into the work of the technical community and we shape policy alongside private industry and civil society. And the primary institution where we do this is the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, or ICANN. ICANN and the IETF are institutional components of the multi-stakeholder system. Regional internet registries and the many different operators of the domain name system and other entities and institutions also form part of the multi-stakeholder system. And if we take a step back and take a broader look, mm -hmm. the system also includes the IGF, the APR IGF, and all of our different national and regional IGF initiatives. But ICANN is the institution where the coordination and collaboration, which ensures the secure and stable operation of the internet takes place. These functions are the fundamental fundamental layer of the internet, kind of like the bedrock of the internet. Uh, some people have referred to this as the public core of the internet. And the multi-stakeholder community at ICANN looks after that bedrock. Uh, most of us go throughout our day without thinking about the bedrock beneath our feet. We're more focused on understanding and navigating what's on the surface. But in order to keep the internet unfragmented and valuable, uh, parliamentarians should develop laws that address what takes place on the surface, but not the bedrock. And so I'd like to cover two things today that hopefully will be helpful to lawmakers who will invariably and increasingly, uh, as Ian mentioned, be asked to solve internet related public policy problems. Uh, so first, I'll just provide some practical uh, examples of how NTIA as a government agency offers support and advice to uh, Congress, to our parliamentarians, our lawmakers. And second, I will describe a multi-stakeholder initiative led by NTIA that instead of a law, very carefully addressed an internet surface problem that involved the internet's bedrock. So this initiative was a voluntary arrangement between a US regulatory agency called the Food and Drug Administration and DNS operators to address the illegal online sale of opioids to Americans. And we called it a trusted notifier program. Um, but first, uh, just a few words about how MTIA offers Congress technical assistance and other help. So I am unfamiliar with how all of everybody else's governments work and how parliamentarians interact with civil or public servants when developing law, but agencies with subject matter expertise, um, particularly telecommunications and foreign affairs ministries may be able to provide guidance. NTIA provides what we refer to as technical assistance. In the United States, technical assistance is an essential part of the relationship between a federal agency and Congress. 
NTIA offers technical assistance on a nonpartisan basis. And it's important to note that when we serve this role, um, technical assistance does not constitute our endorsement or judgment of the merits of the legislation. There is actually a separate process for that, which I will describe shortly. Rather, technical assistance takes the perspective that if the legislation were to become law, are there changes that NTIA would recommend to better ensure its ability to achieve the objective that the legislation seeks to achieve? But technical assistance is different from our role, NTIA's role in an administration process where the agency can offer its judgment on the merits of a proposed legislation. Now, if a law were to come through that would affect the internet, um, this is a separate official method of soliciting input from across the executive branch of the United States federal government. And it, um, it is called a legislative referral memorandum, LRM process. It's run by a government in our office called the Office of Management Sorry, it's run by an office in the US government called the Office of Management and Budget. And this clearance process ensures that US government agencies' communications with Congress regarding legislation are consistent with the president's policies and objectives, and that the administration really is speaking with one voice regarding the legislation. So during the clearance process, uh, OMB circulates items to the affected agencies and offices for the review, and also ensures that all issues or differences between agencies are resolved before providing final clearance. So were a law to come through the LRM process that involved the internet's names, numbers, and protocols, NTIA would certainly wear in, weigh in to share its views. Now, um, having so said, providing that, um, that explanation of, of the landscape and how NTIA provides advice, um, the last thing I'd like to address is the question, when you're faced with an internet policy problem, is it to legislate or not to legislate? I think that is a good first place to start instead of just uh, assuming that legislation is, is the best option. Um, so there are two options that parliamentarians could consider. The first is whether a multi-stakeholder initiative uh, could work instead of a law. And the second is that if the circumstances are such that it is hard to avoid making a law, um, perhaps consider a law that itself provides for a multi-stakeholder process to solve a problem. And uh, while I'm unfamiliar with any legislation like this in the US, I do think there are a few jurisdictions that have quite creatively enshrined multi-stakeholder processes within their own laws. But let me provide that example that I spoke about earlier uh, that NTIA uh, worked on. So the opioid crisis is a tragic problem in the United States. The US government declared the opioid crisis, opioid crisis to be a public health emergency in 2017. Opioid addiction tears families apart and kills tens of thousands of people in my country every year. In 2020, our Department of Commerce and Department of Health launched a pilot program to curb the illegal online sales of unapproved opioids. Under the program, NTIA and the Food and Drug Administration worked with three domain name registries to build a voluntary process for the suspension of domain names tied to websites found to be illegally selling unapproved opioids. The FDA served as what we refer to as a trusted notifier to alert the registries about these relevant websites. As the trusted notifier, it was the FDA, FDA that conducted all of the due diligence on the websites that were selling uh, opioids illegally. Once notified by the FDA, the registries 
could then voluntarily lock the domain, delete the domain, or place the domain on hold as appropriate. And that trusted notifier designation expedited the process for suspending a domain name uh, because the registries can rely on the information that was coming from the FDA. Importantly, the program ran according to a set of agreed upon principles and processes that took us over a year to negotiate altogether, but we got there. Um, now, I'd like to pause here to make an important note that <laughs> when it comes to abusive internet content, it is NTIA's position that generally the DNS should not be the first port of call for action because there are many risks that come with rushing to take down a domain name like taking away all of the email addresses that are tied to that domain name, for example. But given the unique um, crisis of uh, the opioid emergency, and this was a high threshold, um, and the fact that we would take a very careful approach in working with these parties, we decided that would be a useful policy experiment to show how one, voluntary non-legislative action can effectively and sustainably address an internet related problem. Um, so the program resulted in and focused on the legitimate takedown of websites that were directly contributing to America's opioid crisis. And we created this program without the cost and the inflexibility of a legislative process. So to conclude, the internet is underpinned by a well-established and successful system of multi-stakeholder internet governance. And laws that try and touch the global internet's public core, or the bedrock, carry a significant risk of throwing a spanner in the works of our shared technical architecture. So um, if there's political pressure to fix a problem by regulating the global internet's infrastructure, parliamentarians should channel that into the multi-stakeholder system at ICANN, where your governments are already represented in the governmental advisory committee. And if the problem you want to solve is at the internet surface, explore options for a multi-stakeholder or public-private partnership before drafting a bill which can be more sustainable, less expensive, and risk far fewer unintended consequences for the integrity of the internet's technical foundation. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Susan. Um, it, it's always fantastic to hear about each each country's approach to these issues uh, pulling back the the hood of the car a little and showing how they approach some of these challenges and and um, particularly on something as as complex as as uh, managing digital issues and the internet um, i'd um i think i think the point about uh taking some of those problems and uh, working through the GAC at ICANN is, is a fantastic way forward. And I, I'd like to revisit that a little once we get to the discussion point. Um, but um, I'd also encourage you all to um, hold your questions for each of our speakers as well. I, I know you've got a lot of them and I know you're, you're dying to throw them up here on the stage, um, but I might uh, pass to uh, Edmund for, for his thoughts on um, on uh, legislation and policy making in this in this space. Thank you. Thank you. And um, since I've already spoken at the uh, opening, uh, I won't add too much. I know we have a further discussion on uh, uh, on on some of the specific uh, uh, considerations. But I did want to, you know, besides, uh, did want to introduce a little bit about uh, some of Dot Asia's work and. Um, uh, in this area, so of, of earlier, I already mentioned our uh, support to to the youth uh, engagement and and the youth's voices and perspectives into these discussions. And I think whether it's legislature or policies, I think uh, uh, we are trying to build a better internet for for the you know for the future generation. So they are their voices are quite important. And I quote. Um, I, I probably quoted wrong, but um, the closing remarks from the uh, uh, the youth IGF uh, uh, earlier at uh, APR IGF was uh, something like, "Don't uh, don't set rules without 
uh, for youth without youth, something along those lines. Hopefully I didn't mess it too much up. I think that that's, that's important. And that's one of the things that we um, like to support. Uh, and and, and uh, that's also uh, our work at uh, APRI Jeff. When I mentioned the, uh, in the, the opening of the APRI Jeff, I think Dot Asia is serving as the secretariat for the APRI Jeff, one of the very important part is to record um, this multi-stakeholder uh, uh, conversation as we go forward. But um, I did want to use this opportunity to, um, and it, it relates to, I think, the um, legislature and how we think through uh, regulation is one of the newer work that Dot Asia has been working on, uh, which is called the Eco Internet uh, Index. And uh, you can check it out at ecointernet.asia. But what the, it does is actually, it looks at measuring the eco-friendliness of our internet infrastructure. Uh, and why I bring this up as a relevant discussion here is really that, you know, uh, just a few years ago, you must have heard uh, different uh, reports saying, you know, how many trees you're killing by watching movies online, right? I mean, this is a kind of narrative, but one of the things that is important is that, um, and, and the report and the methodology looks into it is that, wait, wait a minute, it's not just about the increasing carbon footprint of the internet, it's also about the services that it replaces, right? I mean, it's the digital economy actually replaces, you know, uh, uh, much more carbon heavy um, uh, 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 activities like, um, you know, driving to the movie theater, right? I mean, that's um, how many trees are you killing then? Uh, so it's the uh, uh, one of the things that we uh, are working on, especially through the eco internet uh, work, is to look at um, the what are the policies and, and regulations uh, should should be should be about thinking through the sustainability for the environment of you know the the internet's impact or the internet's carbon footprint, and not jump to conclusion and saying you know send shorter emails, right? I mean, it's, that's, um, and, but there are things that could be done. I mean, the power that, uh, 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 the energy that powers the internet, incentives for data centers to use renewable energy, those might be sensible uh, incentives for, for legislators or governments to put in place. Policies that even bring renewable energy along with digital inclusion, especially through rural areas, right? Those are um, to, to address both sustainability and poverty together. So I think one of the work that, that we're trying to do is better informed discussions. And I think this is what this session is about. Um, and that is also why the multi-stakeholder um, dialogue, or uh, as uh, Rosemary mentioned earlier in the closing, the exchange of ideas is, is important, is to shape the narrative that then, then inform uh, regulation that can again inform um, uh, legislation to to actually uh, uh, to, to actually make sense. Uh, you know, uh, uh, not only not to hurt the uh, uh, the technical layers, which I'll probably talk a little bit further about as we discuss, but also, you know, in terms of sensible uh, policies that actually uh, can be effective. So. Um, I guess I'll, I'll end here. I think that's uh, what I want to add at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Edmund. I uh, admit I, I did not know about this report. I think I think it sounds like a fantastically useful tool for, for policymakers and lawmakers to, to to have a look at and, and see how they can use the findings and recommendations um, in, in in legislation. Um, I, I assume this is something we, we can attach and send out to uh, yeah. to all those here today. Yeah, this is a sneak preview, and I, I have a few here, but uh, we will officially launch it uh, at the IGF in Kyoto. Great. Thank you for the sneak peek. Looking, looking very much forward to the launch. Um, so I guess talking um, a little bit more about the, the, the region and, um, and some of the various things that might be happening in this, in this space, I might pass to uh, Raj to give us a bit of a snapshot of what's happening in the region as far as uh, policy and regulation. Thanks, Ian. Uh, good afternoon, all. 
obviously I still have quite a bit of energy in me, so I can speak a bit loudly. Um, so we, the, the previous panel was actually quite interesting. I think all you know, all this, uh, the presentations and, and, and whatnot over that, I think it really laid out how the internet actually functions and why there's such an important need for us to continue protecting it. Now, when I say us, unfortunately, for much of the time, it's us as in the technical, internet technical community. Um, but the fact of the matter is today that us should be everyone uh, and parliamentarians in particular uh, you are the ones who passed legislation, debate legislation, and hopefully passed legislation uh, after you've sorted out all the various aspects and the pros and cons and whatnot. Um, but what we are seeing, and so what I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about today is what I see out there in the region. Uh, this year in particular, as travel has come back on, and physical meetings have started up again, I've spent a large part of, a part of this year reconnecting with various governments around the region. Uh, in fact, as my PA reminded me, out of the last eight weeks, I've spent four and a half weeks with governments. So I get to see what they're doing and what they're not doing. Um, now, needless to say, if, you know, when the pandemic came about and we all started depending on the internet to basically save us more or less, um, or keep us sane. Um, it really showed the utility and the power of the internet. So that was in itself, I think, a double-edged sword because not just governments, but some companies and other organizations also could see how they could leverage that. And that leveraging is not always in the good sense. So that's also something to keep in mind. Um, one of the things that we are getting really concerned about is just this stream of laws and regulations that have been put forward. Um, and it's, you know, it's not as if it's just one or two or three countries uh, around the region or around the world for that matter. Uh, what we're also seeing is that those countries which have largely been internet friendly, they have helped the open internet evolve and shape itself they are also putting uh, the internet as we know it under threat. Not always intentionally, but sometimes there is a bit of intention behind the actions as well. So that's also good to keep in mind. Um, the other thing that concerns me is that just the sheer number of people or, or government agencies and departments that are involved in the process now, it's not just really the digital ministries or the ICT ministries. We see the financial services regulator getting involved. We see the competition commission getting involved. And, you know, and then there's a whole bunch of other, I mean, in, in one particular country, the energy regulator is involved in trying to regulate the internet, um, in, according to them anyway. Um, so th the problem with that is not everyone really has the capacity or the understanding of how the internet actually works. I mean, one of the things you will always hear people say from this community in particular is, policy makers don't understand how the internet works and therefore that's problem number one. We've been saying that for the last nearly 30 years now. The problem remains the same. Um, but now what's happening is you've got these various other agencies uh, and departments also getting in on the act. And that's creating greater issues because at least with the ICT folks, they have some knowledge of what uh, digital technologies are and how they operate, or at least how they should operate. The other, flip, uh, the other bad side to that is, you know, when we go and engage with governments, we generally engage with digital slash ICT ministries or the telecom regulator. We don't go and speak to the financial services regulator. We, don't, we do not speak to the competition commission. We do not speak with the energy regulator. So uh, there's already a gap in understanding there as it is. And people, I mean, they, people in those situations will do what they think is right. So that's why the intention may not be bad from their perspective, but it is bad from the internet's perspective. Uh, the other interesting thing that really, really uh, annoys me is that, you know, you've got countries which keep on putting out data saying that we need to have, um, you know, development is key for the future of the economy. We need to use the internet and digital technologies to ensure development keeps on track, et cetera, et cetera. But then you've got the same countries who start restricting the internet in multiple ways, including shutdowns, including filtering, including censorship. In some instances, blocking certain apps because they originate from a certain country or data that is not stored here or data, oh, sometimes we don't even know where the data is stored. Uh, 
But one of the problems, of course, is the way the internet has evolved, it's boundaryless by nature. When you have a, a cloud-based system that could be using and depending on uh, connections and, and, and APIs and other functions, which may not be in that particular country. The whole idea of cloud computing is that you know, it gives us scalability, it gives us risk mitigation because you, know, you can store data just about anywhere, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's also uh, an issue that keeps on boiling up. And again, that understanding does not remain. I mean, I just in the last week and a half, I've had this very lengthy conversation uh, with a, um, in fact, he was a minister uh, of a government in the region. And he was insistent that just as a person enters his country, he will check their visa and their passport and decide whether they can enter the country or not. He should be able to have the same power when things enter his country through the internet. Um, so that straight away tells me that person has no understanding of how the technology actually works. Um, now, so when all that starts happening, what actually happens is that network operators and service providers become the natural target because that's the only way they can control it. That's the layers they can control it. It's either the technical infrastructure layer or the stuff that flows over the technical infrastructure. Content service providers is an example. So let's block, you know, social media company A, B or C or whatever it may be. Um, but what they forget, of course, is that a network operator, their primary role or mandate, if you will, is to move a piece of information, a bunch of packets from point A to point B, and then perhaps to point C. What goes over that connection is really none of their concern, nor is it any of their business, right? That's where privacy, confidentiality, and et cetera, et cetera, comes into play as well. Uh, but again, that is not understood. Uh, if your systems are interconnected, you should be able to stop the packets. Why can't you stop this, but let that uh, keep, you know, keep one thing going and stop the other bits? That's also not really possible, is it? You know, as, and I see around the audience here, many of, our, many of you are from the techno policy community, so you know what I'm talking about. But uh, policymakers don't necessarily understand the same thing. And this is where I think parliamentarians themselves can play such a critical role because one of your mandate as people we elect into power is that you will debate legislation, you will ask the hard questions on our behalf so that the country uh, and the legislations that are passed will serve the citizens' interests. Um, maybe I should just stop there, uh, Ian, perhaps, you know, in the interest of time. I have more to say, obviously. Oh, I, I think we all have a lot more to say. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Raj. Um, and um, I'd, I'd, I'd really like to come back to the to the regional piece as well. I think I think that's a that's a vital um, aspect that I, I really want to touch on. Um, but before we move into a bit of a discussion, I'd, I'd very much like to hear from from Jordan. Thanks, Ian. Uh, kia ora, everyone. Hello. Um, I'm going to offer a few reflections from what is getting frighteningly close to 20 years of involvement in these sorts of discussions. Um, and so I'm not advancing an organizational position per se from out, I'm just giving you some reflections. Um, and I wanna talk about two topics that I think haven't too much been touched on already. Um, one is about the sort of, the, the cultural vibe of technologists in dealing with um, politics and policy. Um, and the other is a sort of um, teasing out of why multi-stakeholder approaches would probably be helpful to you as parliamentarians. Um, <laughs> techies aren't always very good at politics or policy. Uh, there are pretty different debating styles and cultures. Um, sometimes uh, people use the same words to mean different things. People can be very headstrong and confident um, in both sectors, but typically for different reasons. And so, uh, you know, as it is a challenge for MPs and ministers and sometimes officials to understand technology, um, it's also a challenge for the technology community to understand policy and political thinking. Um, and I just wanna say that so that it registers. So I don't wanna overstate or understate that problem, but you just have to take care when you start talking about these issues and engaging with the tech community 
um, that that is an issue and you shouldn't bowl in necessarily an assumption that someone will understand what you're saying uh, in a way that you and your milieu of policy making and politics understand. Um, if you do bowl in like that, you might, um, there might be a, the sorts of arguments that don't really help anyone. Uh, there's their arguments about definition and so on. So it takes a while, it's worth taking some time to get onto common ground. Um, so that's really the first point. Um, most countries have a local country code domain name operator, a CCTLD manager, and they can often be a useful, um, a useful help to copy one of Susan's metaphors about the bedrock of the internet. These organizations operate that bedrock of the internet in your country. And so they can be useful in helping to understand and to share with you implications around various policy and legislative measures. So I'd encourage you if you, if you have such a local organization, and I say that if, because while most places do, some places, uh, while they might have a TLD, it might not be in the country. That's a topic for a different discussion. Um, and they're often well connected with that broader community of people uh, in the country um, that is interested in these internet policy issues. I'll come back to that. Um, I want to talk a bit about multi-stakeholderism and the nature of policymaking. I think everyone who's ever dealt with a government is used to something called consultation, um, where governments ask for views on things and then deal with those views that are expressed and carry on with what they were going to do anyway, in a cynical way, or in a less cynical way, uh, find really useful insights that help to hone a proposal or things that completely invalidate a proposal and change their direction. Um, in all of those scenarios, the decision is being made by the government or the parliament, right? And so consultation is a, is a power relationship that is imbalanced. Multi-stakeholderism, um, if you like, um, if, it's, if it's the thread of the quilt to borrow another one of Susan's metaphors, I guess you could sort of argue that the, um, that we're about spinning the thread that weaves that, that, that quilt together. And, you know, multi-stakeholder approaches that are about bringing the right set of stakeholders together to understand and resolve a problem might feel a bit weird in the political and legislative environment, but they probably have quite a lot of value to offer that you could consider. Uh, these aren't in any particular order, but they can represent a learning process. You know, you, by getting a broad set of stakeholders in, not just to say what they think, but to have an exchange of views, to maybe argue with each other, to tease things out, can deepen everyone's understanding, including yours as decision makers. It might lead to um, better quality input from all of those people into a subsequent consultation process. It can also help drive consensus about the way to approach something in a much more durable way, because it can edge towards that sort of concept of nothing about us without us. It can mean that people with a stake in the outcome by being genuinely involved in sorting out how to do it rather than passively involved in offering an opinion or pretending something legislative isn't happening, actually change their own behavior um, by engaging in such a dialogue process. It can escalate to a more shared decision-making process if, if parliaments or if regulators or legislators are willing to step back from making the final decision and share some power around it. Um, and if nothing else, it can be a, a process that generates norms or shapes norms, the, the underlying expectations in a policy community about how to solve something. Um, and that can be valuable just in sort of smoothing out situations where there might otherwise be what look like intractable agreements. Um, and if that all sounds pie in the sky and rosy and really nice, uh, we, we, the evidence that it works is, lies in the internet because that is how the core institutions of the internet make decisions about what they do. And I don't think any of us can really argue that at a fundamental level, the internet doesn't work. I mean, you've had the pandemic experience of just how reliable it has been and how much value it offers to us all. Um, and there's one other benefit I think there that, that if, if you engage in that process, 
over time, you're helping to foster a local community of people who are engaged there. And that can then help see the connections between various policy issues and lead to an overall lift in how your national community is dealing with technology policy issues. So it seems to me in quite a pragmatic and principled way, as well as principled way, and that there's some advantages from exploring these multi-stakeholder approaches that may not be entirely obvious the first time that you think about them. So I hope I've got you thinking with that a little bit. And I'll probably draw it there for now. Thanks, Ian. Thank you, Jordan. Um, that's gotten a lot of thinking going for me as well. I had some questions here I want to revisit, but just listening to your, your thoughts, I'd, I'd like to um, maybe take the concept of multi-stakeholderism and see if we can uh, work through what that what that actually looks like for, for governments taking part in process. And I want to revisit the one of the points that Susan was making about the, the GAC at ICANN. Um, and you know, without putting Susan on the spot too much, I'm wondering if we might be able to talk about what it's, what it's like uh, to be a, a government representative working through a multi-stakeholder process at, at ICANN. Um, and, and bring a little bit of light and color um, to the, the, the fantastic work that the GAC undertakes at, at ICANN in, in helping to, to uh, exchange knowledge and, um, and help uh, bridge uh, some of those cultural divides that Jordan was, was talking about. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, I'm, I might begin. Uh by talking about a, a little bit more about the process at home that um, <clears throat> that prepares a GAC representative, at least um, in the United States, for being able to engage within the GAC. Um, and I'm actually uh, thinking about something that Raj had said about um, kind of the plurality of different agencies and ministries that uh, traditionally have not um, uh, engaged in internet policy discussion, that that number is increasing. So, so I, I serve as the GAC representative for the United States government at ICANN, um, and my agency convenes uh, what we call the Interagency Working Group for Internet Names and Numbers. Uh, across the United States government, and that's open to any um, uh, uh, federal um, government employee to participate in, but it, it serves as kind of like the substrate and the discussion channel um, for all uh, uh, public servants to discuss internet names and numbers issues, but also to prepare our U.S. government positions for ICANN. So, in in a bit of a sense, it's kind of a a government multi-state, multi-agency government uh, micro universe that is um, uh, preparing uh, our positions uh, for the GAC at ICANN. But um, having been uh, a GAC representative, uh, beginning uh, in during the COVID pan pandemic and having attended a few meetings now in person, I can say that um, engagement in the policy development process at ICANN um, within the GAC is, um, is completely unlike going to negotiate at a multilateral <laughs> treaty institution or treaty conference. Um, it's a very different experience and it, I can understand how it might be a little bit intimidating or challenging at first for uh, some government representatives from different um, countries who've not uh, uh, stood in a line in a public forum next to somebody who is uh, from the engineering community or a tech community or civil society and um, so it does take a little bit of, of getting used to, um, but I do think that the work that the GAC does is incredibly valuable, and I think that especially after COVID, when we saw a churn of, I mean, 
almost all of the GAC was completely replaced in terms of GAC representatives. Um, so we had a lot of new people um, joining the, the, the GAC uh, who had never been there before and who have to learn continually. Um, but it is a useful, um, practical exercise of all of these representatives coming together to hash out um, a consensus-based uh, document at the end of the day that's called a communique. And I do think that through that process, um, you do have exposure to the other positions and perspectives, concerns and priorities um, of GAC representatives in their countries. Um, and I just do feel like we're getting rolling as, as the GAC um, and kind of finding, uh, finding each other and our new processes after the COVID um, uh, experience. Uh, and so I don't know, I'm relatively optimistic that the value proposition for the GAC to other governments is only going to increase. And um, I hope that we can do whatever we can to make that, that a welcoming environment and to encourage more governments to participate. Thank you, Susan. Um, for full disclosure, I work alongside Susan in the GAC. I'm the Australian GAC representative. Um, and so I, I um, also wanted to provide a couple of my, my, my thoughts as well about the value of engaging at ICANN and, and being part of the, the process. Um, it's, it's incredibly valuable to, to take your domestic positions and have very quick and easy access to so many different parts of the internet ecosystem um, to, to be able to, to talk very quickly and easily about, well, here are some of the things that, that I would like and my country would like to do and being able to have access to the people who, who technically can say, yes, this is this is maybe the best way to approach that problem or here are some of those technical challenges and and it's 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 quite rare in the policy making space to have access to that level of community um, engagement and dialogue all in one place um, and so it, it can be quite intimidating but it, it is incredibly valuable to bring all of that richness back to your country and share all those connections and and learnings um, and um, and <laughs> much in the same way as, uh, as, as the, the US does, we also do quite a lot of uh, domestic consultation. And, um, and, and, and again, we work very closely with our CCTL, the operator, um, .au, uh, outer, and lean very heavily on their technical advice about, well, here's how, uh, you know, they technically manage things and, and we can test some of that thinking before bringing it to ICANN. And sometimes we hear things that I can and learn from other governments and then bring that back and test that thinking with our uh, domestic te technical and civil society community as well. Um, and, uh, and finally, the, the, the final piece is, um, I would also encourage you to bring um, other parts of your government to ICANN as well. Uh, my, my department has a, a lot of functions in it. <laughs> with the Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Communications. Um, one of the learning processes that we've been on recently is, is bringing uh, other parts of our department to ICANN um, who, can, who can see the digital component and the connection in some of the other policy work that we do and help bring bridge those connections and shed new light on old policy issues. Um, and so, you know, as I said earlier, digital touches on so many different facets of the policy making process um, and, and simply having access and exposure to the multi stakeholder community can really drive new policy thinking forward, um, even if it may not have been apparent at, at first glance. Um, so I, I think I think I can is, is, a, is a fantastic place to have have these have these discussions and and um, I, I would encourage um, uh, particularly governments in our region. Um, to 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 come join the GAC and, and, and take part in the um, in the conversation. Um, so uh, I guess I guess from that point I'd like to um, um, uh, pivot pivot a little and um, and revisit the, uh, the the regional piece just a little. Um, you know I think um, I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about um, some of the some of the challenges that. Um, 
that uh, potentially Edmund or, or, or Raj in the first instance might be hearing about uh, some of those legislative challenges that we're facing and, and, and the role that organizations like, like Dot Asia can, can, can play in helping to, uh, to drive that policy conversation forward. Um, who would like to, um, I, I guess, take my, my very awkwardly worded uh, question? I'm usually good to go with anything, so yeah, I'll give it a go. Um, okay, so so just you know, as we were talking about, I mean, uh, I guess we talked quite a bit about ICANN in this session as well. Um, so there's something else that needs to be kept in mind is that the, the people, and you, you would know this first, firsthand, the people who go to those GAC meetings from governments are not necessarily the ones who are involved in making the decisions or even developing the policies that are affecting the internet. You know, and, and what we see is that quite a few in the region, it sort of carved out to some chap or some lady who will go and um, you know, the other stuff is done by someone else and sometimes they don't even know each other. And it's happened to me quite a few times, I've met someone in the GAC. Um, and then when I go to one of the usual multilateral meetings I go to and I say, oh, do you know this person? I have no idea who that is. Well, they work in your department, I've got the same address as you, but now, yeah, no, don't know who that is. So, so there is that disconnect. And sometimes I think we overlook that fact, you know, we get so in, engrossed in ourselves that, oh, this is how things are working and where they work. We forget that most of those actual other decisions are made somewhere else. Um, the other problem is that uh, Rosemary is here. So when we caught up earlier this week, we were reminiscing in the good old days when we used to work together in a thing called APEC, as part of the APEC, APEX um, working group. And we used to do some great stuff, which is what you know, Rosemary reminded me of that. We, and we got things done because in that particular forum, there is a, was a spirit of cooperation, right? It, and, and it was the thing about, I like the teleworking group or even the newer iteration, the DSG at the moment is that it's people who are there to actually try and solve a problem as opposed to someone trying to create a problem. And that, that's how I've always described uh, TELWG in particular. And of course, having multi stakeholders in that, both, both of us away from you know, non-government uh, entities, that really made a difference because we could lead projects, we could be part of projects, and we could actually help effect the change. There are not too many instances like that where that is possible. So if you look at a lot of the uh, intergovernmental, like the, the main regulatory body in the region is APT. To engage in APT, you need to be a member. Yes, you can go in as an observer, but then you can't do anything. You're there to observe. To be a member, you can be an affiliate member, like ISOC is, uh, APNIC, I believe, is as well. You have to be sponsored by a government where you have a legal entity in, incorporated. Mm -hmm. That gives you certain rights that you can do things with them. And then the member states themselves, of course, are the ones who are there to do things and deliber deliberate on things and, and so on. The problem is we, as the internet community, cannot attend all those meetings. I think APT alone has something like 15 meetings a year on different aspects which impact the internet. So it's also about an issue of capacity and resource. How do you do this, right? And if you really want to effect change, you have to be in all those discussions and all those deliberations. It is just simply not possible for Right. We are not resourced to do that. So then where do you go and make those changes? You know, maybe you can nitpick a couple of those major meetings where you know uh, there'll be greater impact. So that's what the Internet Society does, for example. We don't go to all the 15 meetings, maybe two, three or four. Um, but and then there's another side to it that when you go to those meetings, you have to sound intelligent to the people you're engaging with. As an example, uh, the week before last, I was at the Red, uh, World Radio Conference uh, prep meeting. Now those meetings ran from 9 a.m. in the morning until 10, uh, 10 30 p.m. every night. Now, luckily my background is actually in, not in the internet community, I come from the telecoms world. So I could make sense of what they were saying and I could make sense of what I was saying. Uh, but then we had some other colleagues from other organizations at that meeting who were just completely lost in that meeting because they just could not understand the level of detail that these um, uh, government officials were talking at. So, but yet they were making decisions which could impact us. For example, they were talking about certain spectrum allocations, which potentially could impact the further uh, evolution of 
Wi-Fi or indeed uh, the 2.4 gig spectrum. So I, I won't get geeky with all this, but the point is that, uh, you know, sometimes we say that, you know, we can make the change in these one, two, four, but that is not the case of what's happening there in the ground. And just one last thing I'll say, even if we put all that effort in, most decisions these days seem to be made on populist narratives. So it's because we need to save the kids, so we need to save, okay, it's a national security issue, the terrorists are coming, this is happening, that is happening, and therefore we need to break encryption, we need to fragment the internet, we need to create splinter nets, we need to protect ourselves, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, again, that's a very slippery slope to go down. Sorry, Ian, I've taken too much time. Sorry, Matt. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Edmund. Uh, just building right off what Raj said, that's that's really what we want to you know want to con contribute to is to make sure that the narrative is 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 correct. I mean, yes, of course, we want to stop terrorists, but that doesn't mean censoring everything on the internet, right? Um, and the other thing that I uh, I think Raj says is very true, and and build building on what um, uh, uh, um, the the the. The GAC uh, representatives. Uh, one of the one of the the challenges is that the participation. They're they're not only not decision makers. They change all the time, right? Um, and Susan mentioned earlier that that there's a big uh, changeover uh, in in terms of the GAC representatives. That's also a a, a big challenge. And I think um, the it it's. Um, I guess not only in Asia Pacific, but uh, I, from my observation, Asia Pacific seems to be especially um, uh, uh, that case. And because of what Raj says, it's for lack of a better way to say it, um, they're probably not as high high up uh, in the in their own hierarchy, and therefore they're not really able to to bring that uh, uh, discussion back home. And also the continuity of which it makes it difficult because they're not that high up. The passing over of that knowledge and information also uh, be, becomes a challenge. Um, and then I want to just quickly. Um, uh, respond also to the consultation uh, aspect, and therefore, um, uh, uh, you know, really going from the 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 the, the GAC experience and not being able to bring that multi-stakeholder uh, uh, experience from ICANN, from the GAC, from uh, their back home to the Asia Pacific regions, make consultation uh, processes less effective, even when you uh, 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 involve a kind of multi-stakeholder uh, 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 kind of composition to it, because uh, the key aspect that we, we see that is successful, whether it's uh, at the IGF or at ICANN, is the agenda setting process is also multi-stakeholder driven. And that's where the input can come in. That's where you can set to, towards the right direction. I think um, Raj also mentioned that in the APT and you know, why that's uh, effective is because multi-stakeholders are involved in setting the direction. And that's, that I think is going to be uh, what will make the difference because Legislation itself um, is always going to trail innovation in some sense. I think there was a question about uh, innovation and the idea of the internet being uh, kind of an open and interoperable platform for permissionless in innovation um, cre creates a, a, a way for people to innovate, but that also that doesn't mean that we shouldn't and should never uh, put in place protection and regulation to, to rein back some of the innovations that may have intended to be good, but could turn bad, right? I mean, Google great as, gave us great uh, search capabilities, but you know, it turned out that we, we gave out a lot of our privacy with that. Does that mean we shouldn't then, you know, look back at it and say, wait a minute, there's something that we need to do about this. Uh, uh, and so, but, but that process needs to be a, I believe needs to engage the multi-stakeholder uh, in, in understanding um, and the earlier uh, uh, panel already said the, the different, the, the multi-layer architecture of the internet and um, how some of the policies or, or regulation that you, you put may intervene and unintentionally uh, um, uh, 
uh, affect or fragment the, the, the lower layers or the technical layers of the internet. Uh, Ian, when you uh, first opened, uh, I think you carefully used the term uh, phrase uh, uh, governance on the internet. And that's really more of the upper layers or the application, the user layers of the internet. But sometimes legislation and regulations uh, that were intended for that layer could have unintended, you know, kind of uh, uh, impact to the lower layers. And I like to use the GDPR as an example. I personally believe that it was a uh, it was a genuine intent to bring better balance for the users to you know bring in privacy. Unfortunately, the, it actually has other uh, uh, impact, right? Um, maybe they didn't realize that the, the Whois protocol, for example, the Whois database would be affected to that degree, uh, which actually affects the, the, the technical uh, operations of, of the internet as well. So this is why I think, you know, uh, even at the agenda setting uh, process, um, the multi-stakeholder model and the multi-stakeholder experience is very valuable uh, starting from the GAC or starting from participation at the IGF, at the regional forums, um, bringing back to, to the local, uh, you know, legislation and regulation and from the government. Thank you. I, I know I promised an opportunity to open up for questions and I um, really wanted to do that a little while ago, but I'd like to do that um, at this point in the session. Um, so are there any questions uh, either online or from in the room? Yes, please, Paul. Uh, Paul Wilson from APNIC. Um, I uh, heard the term multi-stakeholder used uh, once uh, outside of the internet context uh, quite a few years ago when the Australian electricity industry was undergoing some shake-up and, uh, and a spokesperson described uh, a multi-stakeholder process. Uh, and in those terms, the stakeholders they were talking about were consumer groups, uh, retailers, generators, and so on. And um, I found that really interesting. I was listening for more, and uh, I never heard it mentioned again. But I wonder, I wonder whether um, it is actually appearing anywhere else uh, outside of the internet um, community, either with in name or not, and and to what extent those uh, can be very um, useful examples. Who'd like to take that question? Oh, just very briefly, yes, I've seen some instances. Um, interestingly, one is the agriculture industry, uh, where they've got this, what they call community consultations, and it ends up being multi-stakeholders. So they've got your, I, I won't go through it all, but yeah, so that, that's one industry I've seen it in. But, you know, the, the other thing to note here is that their interpretation of multi-stakeholder, I think, is sometimes different to how we interpret it, right? And and the couple of instances I've seen it outside in the agriculture, and there's two or three that just don't come to mind right now, but I have this on a list somewhere I can send it to you because I had to use this for someone. Um, but but their interpretation is different. You know, it's, I wouldn't say it's of the same nature of multi-stakeholderism that we employ, that they do. It and, it and for them, and the way it was explained to me by someone was, you know, they've gone from you know, their idea of a consultation was, you know, people in the department deciding what to do. Then it went to getting a few people from industry, usually a vendor or a manufacturer, and you sort, discuss and sort it out. Not unlike the telecom industry used to be. Uh, but now they've gone to this slightly wider uh, one. And, and the other interesting thing that I've heard is that, you know, um, Oh, the, the construction industry was the other one, you know, when you apply for uh, to do a development area. So that, that was the other one. Um, and one of the fears, so I was in this webinar uh, just a couple of weeks ago by Engineers Australia, which was look, and it was titled Community Engagement in Engineering. And, and one of the things they were grappling with was the reputational risk they had if they did not engage with community. For example, one person said, if the environment people get hold of this fact, they will destroy our project. Therefore, we need to engage with them. So that's just one quick example. I guess quickly in response, actually, um, multi-stakeholder 
uh, in you know when when I, even when I was studying business school, the multi-stakeholder uh, approach is exactly what Raj says uh, that it's an approach when you talk about those uh, steep analysis, the social, technical, environmental, political uh, aspects around your um, your project or whatever, and then you actually divide and conquer. You try to make sure that they fight with each other so much that you can actually do your project. Well, I, I'm paraphrasing, um, but the, the multi-stakeholder model that we talk about is a much more uh, a collaborative uh, model from, from the bottom up and from uh, agenda setting, as I, as I mentioned. The only um, other area that I've uh, genuinely heard that, that it's sort of being used uh, nowadays uh, is from the climate change uh, area. They, they seem to use this uh, 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 concept that is closer to what we what we would see here at the uh, uh, internet governance. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, please, Rosemary. Uh, Ro Rosemary Sinclair from um, .au Domain Administration. Um, I'm going all the way back to um, Susan's presentation. It um, sounded to me when you were describing that <clears throat> pardon me, example of multi-stakeholderism with the FDA and the opioid crisis, um, that uh, one of the features of that was um, the speediness of the process, bringing the stakeholders together. Um, I was interested in how it had gone. Have you had any uh, you know, measures of effectiveness or impact from that type of process? Sure, thank you for the question. Um, <clears throat> so there have been, I'm not sure about the number of websites these days, but at, at least a year and a half ago, I believe that about 30 websites were, uh, were taken down, but I would caution uh, too much focus on, on the actual number of websites that were removed because I think it's really the process and the relationships that were established over time between regulators from uh, an independent agency who are just uh, steadfastly focused on one thing, which is um, taking away illegal opioid access um, to Americans. And uh, on the other hand, um, registry operators who don't have any meaningful or any role at all in dealing with website content. Um, when you bring people together who are stakeholders in a process, it's important that everybody is kind of sharing the same high level goal that can unite people and encourage them to take the time over um, months and months to better understand each other's um, incentives, uh, each other's risks. Um, when you have that honest conversation and it does take time. At the end of the day, you are building trust. Uh, so I would say no pun intended, but yes, it's trusted notifier. That's, <laughs> that's what you do. You build trust over time. And then, um, and then you find that process and that pathway forward. So those relationships still exist. Um, each of the three registries continue to work with the, the FDA on a voluntary basis. And um, once NTIA kind of brought everybody together, helped everybody to find their way uh, in terms of that process, we, we saw our role as being done. Um, so it's, it's, so we just kind of let it, let it free and let those relationships uh, flourish. But it, it really was, and, and um, earlier during this session on fragmentation, which was fantastic, by the way, um, I believe Ms., um, Minister Tang um, 
uh, uh, described what I believe was what sounded to me quite like a similar voluntary process. So it was really neat to hear that. Um, I do think this, this policy mechanism has a lot of promise um, and it offers a lot of creativity and hopefully um, parliamentarians will be able to uh, kind of explore it a bit more. Um, thanks. Thank you. I think we are beginning to come to the end of this session. Um, I'm not seeing any further hands and I haven't seen any further hands online. Uh, so I might give each of our uh, lovely panelists a final word before we wrap up, being with Edmund. Um said quite a lot, so not too much to add, except that uh, I think this is, a, this is a great beginning. Hopefully this, uh, uh, I, I do believe that the, um, the parliamentary track is a very important component going forward for the uh, IGF movement. So uh, whether it's uh, at the Asia Pacific regional level, uh, as well as other uh, national and regional initiatives, as well as the global level, uh, this kind of uh, dialogue and, uh, and having uh, legislators and at least having the mindset of uh, legislators uh, on as we discuss these issues are, are really important. I don't think I've got much to add further because I think <clears throat> the discussion has led to a lot of different perspectives on this challenge that, that legislators face in dealing with internet policy. Um, I've got no more um, uh, sound bites to add on that front, so I'll just pass the mic along. Um, just a note of thanks for being able to participate in this session, and I do hope that these types of uh, sessions flourish and go forward in the future, and um, yeah, nothing else. Thanks. Um, <laughs> much like Edmund, I've spoken enough already, so I won't give another 10-minute speech. Um, just one thing, or two things maybe. Um, one, I think the various perspectives were interesting in themselves. And, you know, it's always nice when a panel comes from different angles onto a topic rather than everyone saying the same thing. Um, second thing uh, about the multi-stakeholder thing, it, you know, what Paul asked and then what you spoke about, Ian, it just occurs to me that if only we could better mainstream our model of multi-stakeholderism, that other sectors and industries use and employ it. You know, we describe it, we talk about it, but we talk about it in our lingo, right? We don't necessarily, are able, we're not necessarily able to promote it to other sectors and groups. If we were able to do that, and if they were also able to adopt similar processes, then suddenly it becomes a mainstream thing that everyone does as a matter of course, right? Then that perhaps just becomes the norm as opposed to being something those techie guys do and we don't so just yeah. that did in fact remind me of a, a further soundbite to offer just briefly which is that uh, there is a language problem here and there's a narrative problem here um if the internet and technology community was um better at explaining what it does in language that most people use rather than uh, horrendous piles of acronyms and jargon at least when it's outward facing and engaging in these broader discussions, that could well help. And if it had a story to tell about how its governance model contributes directly to uh, its success as a system and could be helpful in dealing with further up the layer digital policy challenges, that'd probably be helpful as well. I'll stop now, I promise. Um, and I would just add that well, so fully support uh, uh, what Jordan had just said. Um, we're, I think we're at the beginning here. Um, Edmund mentioned the GDPR. Nowhere in the GDPR do the words domain name system appear. Uh, there are laws that are being passed um, that, that contain the words root server system, 
um, domain name system. This is increasingly going to happen. Um, and so just to emphasize that understanding what that means when we're all trying, different nation states are trying to regulate a global commons and, and regulating the DNS um, from their different perspectives and layers, being able to communicate the importance of a multi-stakeholder approach and to be able to convey that in language that people understand is only gonna become more important over time. Thank you. So I'd like to close this session. Uh, please join me in a round of applause for our, our lovely panelists here this afternoon. And that also marks the close of the first day of the APR IGF parliamentary track. Um, I hope you all found it um, as uh, thought provoking and useful as, as I did. Um, please join us um, all back here at 9.30 tomorrow, uh, both online uh, or in person. Um, and for those in the room, um, I would please like to invite you out onto the terrace for a uh, lovely networking event hosted by ICANN. Thank you and have a good night. <laughs>